What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences. And that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment what I saw these young African Americans doing was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good afternoon. I know it may seem like actually closer to evening, but we are not going to let this uh, Eastern Standard Time get us down. It is still good in 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So <laughs> let's give a round of applause for being able to make it and see another <laughs> afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us for the Schomburg Center's Open House, which is dedicated to the theme of memory and how we may give li new life to memory through storytelling, genealogy, art, and archiving. I know for so many, the pandemic really sort of put a pinpoint on the fragility of life, but oftentimes when you are black, when you are black and a woman, when you are a whole host of identities, this fragility of life is not lost on you, and this is not the first time that you felt that. So I'm grateful for a place like the Schomburg Center where we have so many memory workers, where we have archives that allow us to see ourselves day in and day out, that allow us to comfort ourselves possibly, that this is not the first time and it won't be the last time and getting through is possible. My name is Novella Ford and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. And this day is not possible without our Associate Producer, Kalila Bates, the work of many staff members and curators from our five divisions, our facility staff, our security, our volunteers, our Chief of Staff, KC, and our Center's Director, Joy Bivens. So I'm gonna ask you all to please give them all a round of applause. If you have time in your day, if you're here in the Schomburg Center as well as watching live online, I invite you to visit our exhibitions that are currently on view that will be closing soon. The Media Gallery, which is featuring our cura curator's choices of items from Surinamese textiles that serve as an archive of memory to the papers of Melvin Dixon, who was a scholar, poet, and a novelist, who died in 1992 at the age of 42 from complications related to AIDS. His personal writing was about bearing witness and taking responsibility for our individual and collective legacies. And like I mentioned earlier, there is so much that we can learn from the archives. As you can see, the Schomburg Center is open. So if you've been wondering, the Schomburg Center is open. We are available for your uh, appointments, for research appointments. We are also doing a nice collection of both in-person programming as well as online programming. So I invite you to visit our website at schombergcenter.org. Um, Unlike my associate producer who thinks that I'm going to speak very long, I will not. Because <laughs> I want to get to this conversation, which I have been excited for, um, for as long as first this book has been out, Tarana's book has been out, but then she had another book come out before that, and all the work that she's been doing. And I really had the pleasure of meeting Toronto as just a person who would come here to the Schomburg Center and was so warm and welcoming and always championing um, young women and black girls and black femmes. And so to see all of this come sort of full circle as Tarana has just continued to do her work has been a pleasure to see. And so I am grateful that she got off of a red eye and decided to be here with the Schomburg today. This afternoon's program, The Ethics of Care, features two incredible women, like I mentioned, Tarana Burke discussing her memoir, Unbound, My Story of Liberation and the Birth of the Me Too Movement. But they will also discuss exploring crafting, they will also explore crafting your own history and the kind of care necessary for honesty, vulnerability, and liberation. This conversation will be moderated by writer and cultural critic Sasha Bonet. These are two writers who know something about care and making space for not just truth, but for hard truths. Also following the conversation, Tarana will be available for a book signing in the Langston Hughes lobby as long as she will allow us to have her here. I'll tell you just a little bit about both of them and then I will invite them out to the stage. For more than 25 years, activist and advocate Tarana J. Burke has worked at the intersection of sexual violence and racial justice, fueled by commitments to interrupt sexual violence and other system, system, systemic inequalities disproportionately impacting marginalized people, particularly black women and girls. Tarana has created and led various campaigns focused on increasing access to resources and support for impacted communities, including the Me Too movement, which to date has galvanized millions of survivors and allies around the world. Please welcome Tarana Burke.
And as I mentioned, joining her in conversation is Sasha Bonet, who is a writer, critic, and an educator living in New York City. While employing various mediums for, story, mediums for storytelling, Bonet's work explores the ways in which race, gender, and art influence cultural norms and the way we experience them. Bonet shifts from criticism to profiles to narrative nonfiction with the objective of illuminating the nuances of the human experience. She also has a new book out called The Water Bearers. Please welcome Sasha Bonet. I think they want us to switch seats. Oh, unfortunately. <laughs> Don't follow directions. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, I'm so glad to and be here. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And we both were talking backstage about how much we love this space and how much it means to both of us. And I was telling her that I live just across the street in Linux Terrace and I would just be coming home with groceries and I'd see the big sign saying there was someone talking and I'd just stop in oh, yeah. um, for talks all the time. And you're also yeah, I lived, living I in lived Harlem. Yeah, I lived in the Savoy. For, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm born and raised in New York, from the Bronx, lived in Harlem before yeah. I moved. So. Harlem <laughs> world. I, I gotta figure, always figure out what I gotta do to get back to Harlem. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to be here with it everyone. Is. And um, thank you, Novella, for that beautiful thank introduction. Thank you, Novella. Um, so we're here to talk about Toronto Burke's uh, memoir, Unbound, and you're gonna read us a short passage, no? Sure. Um, I don't know if you have like a specific... It's <laughs> <laughs> a little warm, I'm gonna go ahead and take this first layer off. Yes. Um, maybe there's a part in the book that you feel most drawn to. Um, Let's see. Do you have a part in the book that you feel drawn to? Well, there is definitely a part that I feel okay, really I'll close to. That. And then um, it's actually starting, this is about Maya Angelou, yeah. who I also call Mother Maya <laughs> and have a really close relationship with. Um, when she, when you discover, I know why the caged bird sings, mm. and you also discover that Maya Angelou was molested as a child by her mother's boyfriend, Mr. Freeman. Um, and that's on page 69. Okay. If you wanna read um, a little bit from that, and that really stood out to me for many reasons that we can talk about after you start reading, but um, it just kind of speaks to the power of stories, the power of storytelling, um, and what it can illuminate for us. Okay, I'm gonna start girls. here from this. Okay. Reading. reading the opening chapter about young Maya running out of the church, peeing on herself, reminded me of a similarly embarrassing moment in my own life. There was something so strangely comforting about reading how she laughed at her embarrassment, even though she knew the adults would punish her and the other kids would tease her. I found myself wishing that I was her friend so that I could learn to laugh at myself too, even when I was scared. I kept reading, fascinated by the way she talked about her thoughts and emotions and how many of them mirrored how I felt about myself. And then Mr. Freeman was introduced. I understood now why my mother might have been wary of, reading, of my reading this book too soon. Maya Angelou wrote about being molested and raped by her mother's boyfriend when she was eight years old. My mom, who had no idea that my life was being mirrored in this book, likely didn't want me to read it in an attempt to protect me from an ugly reality I had unfortunately already experienced. Instead of being horrified and compelled to ask incessant questions, I was being introduced to a truth that would forever alter my life. My 12-year-old mind had not understood that this was a thing that happened to other girls who were innocent. I thought it was just me, or at least girls like me. I thought I was the kind of girl who bad things happened to. When I read about what happened to a young Maya Angelou, I was able to read her as innocent in a way I didn't allow of myself. Maya was decent and nice, and it seemed egregious that God would have allowed something so horrible to happen to her. It was the first time I ever realized a little girl like her could have gone through what I went through. I finished the book and kept what was now, in my mind, our secret. To my 12-year-old self, Maya Angelou was just another name on my mother's bookshelf. She wasn't Dr. Maya Angelou, the esteemed poet, author, activist, and all-around legend. She was a lady who wrote a book that shared my secrets. She was my confidant. I no longer felt alone. 
That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And that was a really heavy part of the book for me um, because I felt also a kind of access to Maya Angelou in the same way mm -hmm. as a young girl who was also molested quite young. Mm -hmm. And I feel like her words were really accessible. Yeah. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is you talk in the book about feeling shame and feeling guilt as a child and that becoming kind of like this inherent emotion that we take on. Um, after being sexually abused. And then, so basically we tell ourselves these stories in our heads, you know, and then we find ways for, to reinforce these stories, like mm -hmm. through life, you know, through experiences. And then there's this story that comes along and kind of shakes all of that up and rattles that. Um, so I kind of wanted you to expand a bit on the power of stories, mm -hmm. how it's worked in your life. And then you have this line where you say, where had her shame gone? How could a body that holds that kind of pain also hold joy? And you kind of were feeling this envy. While I was finding newfound comfort in anger, she was smiling. Yeah, that was, I don't know if that was envy as much as it was awe. Yeah. You know, um, when I got to high school and I, and I discovered more of her in the book, I talk about this particular incident when my high school honors English uh, teacher introduces her poetry into I the classroom. That. Yeah, and so. Phenomenal woman. But yeah, it was phenomenal woman, and, but it was the first time I heard her voice, All right? I had only read her books. My mother had her entire collection of books to date, and I was fascinated just, just in a childlike way by the names and the, the covers were colorful, mm -hmm. and it was like, Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want to ring a, read a book that's like singing and swinging and getting merry like Christmas, right? right? Like right. that sounds yeah. like fun. And she was so true to herself. And yeah. Like the titling and every way that she All of it was just, books. it just drew me to it. And so I felt a kinship when I read the book, but right. when I heard her voice, uh -huh. there was something in her voice that made me, it, was, it just sat on my chest, right? It yeah. was like, well, why is she so happy? Right. Why is she so, you know, this video that we saw, um, and my daughter, I think, I think it's the video, my daughter found something on YouTube that feels like it might be the video, but it's like her in this black and still see, she's wearing like a black gown. Yeah. With glit, like sparkles, probably sequins. <laughs> um, and she's laughing and she's reading the poetry and she's making little jokes in the thing. And I, I remember watching that and thinking, I thought, not, obviously that but in my mind I thought what she was teaching me and I know why the cage bird sings was how to fake it essentially. Right. Right? Yeah, a mask. How to how, how, to, to, how to create a mask, a mask how right. to put those things aside and still create a life, but knowing that this is who you really are. Right. And this person I saw did not feel like they were faking anything. Yeah. Her it body was like, carrying something. Oh yeah. It yeah. felt like pure joy. It felt like real laughter. It felt like confidence mm -hmm. that I just could not, where do you get that from? Right. And it threw, And how do you get to that point? Which right. Something you say, like, how do you get from How do you get from here to are, there? Yeah, to, because the, to the joy. At that point where I was, was very angry and, and wanting to fight all the time and mm -hmm. not feeling good about myself. Mm -hmm. um, which she also writes about, about feeling ugly and feeling mm -hmm. like she was never going to be beautiful. Absolutely. Right. I just was like, well, yeah, this is what we do. Right? Yeah. This is where we are. But yeah. she had discovered something that I was like, oh, wait, is there more to this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's where that question came from. Right. I was like, how does this body that holds so much pain, because I know the pain. I, I just couldn't imagine that it went anywhere. Yeah, because I'm, you can't, your imagination can't even go it can't, that far. It can't. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm looking at her and I'm like, if the pain doesn't go anywhere, where do you fit the joy? Right. How does it, can our bodies hold both? Right. This is my like 15 year old brain trying right. to decipher right. this. Right. And like, and even then I was very inquisitive as a child and very, I'm Virgo, so I'm like, I need data. <laughs> <laughs> I need facts. <laughs> yeah. And I was just, I was just super curious about it. Yeah. And, um, but it also helped change my, that seed, it was just like the first seed that was planted with reading the book. Right. That seed 
made me curious in a way that was like, there, there might be something else. There might be something more than anger, and more than shame, and more. I just, I don't know how to get there yet. And it took me a while right. to get there. But if she had not planted that seed, I wouldn't even, I don't think I would have known to look for it or it would have taken me a much longer time to try to figure right. out for it. And stories have the power to do Absolutely. that, which is why your story is so important, you know? Um, and you also say of Sonia Sanchez that you that she had written something that said her oh, sister, sister was raped, mm -hmm. right? Her sister was raped, and she felt like her sister was raped because she was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Sonia and she was, was like, spared. I haven't. Right, she was yeah. spared because of her ugliness. Yeah. And that also kind of stirred something up in you and kind of disrupted these stories. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> disrupted these stories that you had been telling yourself, that you had been reinforcing yeah, inside and of yourself. As I got older and I met, even in my peer group, right, everybody, we all tell our story. We have to, for our own survival, create an explanation as to why this happened. Right. Right? Save the religious part, right? There's, there's, there's a part if you have a, if you're religious or have faith, and there's, there's the like, why did God let this happen? That's separate. Right. There's also this, this question, I think, that we, psychologically, our bodies, our minds start to create a thing, mm -hmm. right? I said, I, I say this in the book, I think that for years, I inserted language in the story of what happened to me that I don't know that happened. And I, when I, once I started doing therapy, and, and I was like, oh, I don't think that's actually happened. Right. Where I told myself that, that the person who harmed me said, this is what happens to ugly little girls. Mm -hmm. That I don't really have evidence that that happened. Mm -hmm. I think I inserted that memory into the mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. to make it all make sense right. in some way. Right. And I just think that's what we do. We, it's a... It's, uh, a, a, a sense of protection. Oh, this must have happened because she's pretty. Oh, this must have happened because she's thick. She's th yeah. whatever the things yeah. are, right? She's developed too soon. Right. When, when it, all of it is a, a product of us, of the onus being on us, when it really is not our burden to bear. Exactly. This happened because somebody who wanted to harm you sought out to harm you. It has literally nothing to do with anything but yeah. that. Yeah. But who, how would you know that at 12? Right. But as an adult, you've run into oh, yeah. um, this person who assaulted you, mm -hmm. and you didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And you said that that's not your job. Your it's, job is to heal yourself. And this is what I tell survivors all the time. And it's, you know, I've carried all kind of, I've carried guilt about that. I've carried anger about it, all kind of things. But when you experience violence, period, particularly sexual violence, our job, we've done the work. Mm -hmm. The work is to survive. Mm -hmm. If you manage to come out on the other side, and a lot of us come out on the other side physically alive, but we haven't survived. Right. Right? We hear about, you know, we, we, you hear about all of these pipelines, you know, and all of the, the you know, the, the, the mass incarceration and the numbers of people who are dealing with mental health. And a lot of the roots of that come from violence, childhood sexual abuse or mm -hmm. sexual violence and, or other kinds of trauma that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. So there is a, if you're able to come through that with part of your life intact and start, and then even beyond that, start on a journey to try to become whole and get back to that, that is your only job. Right. And I think that what society tells us now is that you have to, your job is to tell your story, and make sure everybody knows it. Your job is to make sure that person pays or right. somebody is accountable. Right. And I'm like, these are all extras, you know? Yeah. Because the reality is we can't control the other person. Right. There's nothing that I could do to control what that man does or doesn't do at all. Right. I can only control myself. So if I expend all of my energy into hating or even some plot to, to do whatever, what does that leave for my life? Right. So that's where I, you know, some people, people may disagree and that's, that's fine, but for me and for the way I talk to other survivors, I want you to survive first. Uh-huh. Because surviving is not even the end goal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Surviving is just, is a particular state and I, and I think I had an elder once who, who used to just describe it as survival is like your head above water and you're paddling furiously underneath, mm -hmm. right? 
So you can breathe and you're alive, but is that the life you want? Right. Do you really want to spend your life expending this kind of energy just right. to breathe? Right. Trying to break stroke. Right. Yeah. It's like it's like thriving yeah. is being able to come out of the water. Right? Mm -hmm. And and wholeness is being able to reach back in the water to help pull somebody else out. That's so beautiful. So I'm trying to be more than a survivor, <laughs> you know? That's hard. Yeah. We, we, I, we gotta survive a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. Right? <laughs> you know? Absolutely, that's just one part. That's just it. one part. Right. I'm still black and a woman and a mother, and <laughs> like, I got a whole lot of surviving to do. I don't have to, like, <laughs> I gotta thrive somewhere. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> you talk about that too, like um, how you were afraid to talk to your mother mm -hmm. and how when you became a mother, you were able to understand your own limitations as a mother and yeah. be okay with that. Yeah. Um, and then also to recognize your mother's limitations because now you're an adult, you're a woman, you're a black woman. We you can look back and reflect and understand your mother in a different way. And then being able to live with understanding that you have those limitations. Absolutely, I think we don't talk enough about capacity. Mm -hmm. and, and this is especially why- Especially not with black women. Especially not with black women, because we're supposed to have all the capacity, yeah. right? We're and supposed like, to be, be able to do all the things. Yeah, exactly. And the reality is, and, and with children, irrespective of race, children, we see our parents as superheroes. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'll never forget my daughter once listening, was playing outside when I was living down south and was arguing back and forth with a friend. And it was like, yes it is, no it is, you know, that kind of thing. And then my daughter got indignant and got upset. Yes it is, because my mommy told me so. Right. And I was like, <laughs> you arguing that hard about something I said? <laughs> I'm like, child, you don't know my life. <laughs> I don't even know what I know. <laughs> you know? But it was such a, it was yeah. such a, like a moment of like, wow, this, child will know what I give them, what yes. I pour into them. And so at the same time, I mean, I had, a, I had my daughter at 24. Right. And my kid is about to turn 24, and I'm looking at them now like, your choices are interesting. <laughs> I just, you know, you're a child. Right, They're right. Not, what, didn't they say the medulla oblongata don't get quite right when you're 25 or something <laughs> right. like that? So you I don't, don't understand know. you were a child then. Exactly. Able to and, see so, that. and so my point about it, though, is that Capacity versus desire is a really important conversation that we have to have, mm -hmm. and it's a, an understanding, I think, because most of us have the desire to be perfect. Perfect parents, perfect lovers, right. perfect whatever. And that's a burden. That's a burden. Yeah. It, perfection is not reality, right? right. And that's from and, a Virgo, yeah. And that's <laughs> a triple Virgo. <laughs> oh no. I also have Virgo rising. Oh no. So, we'll talk about that later. But, <laughs> but the reality is we set our expectations of other people based on desire, mm -hmm. not on capacity. Mm -hmm. And when they fall short of those expectations, we are disappointed, mm -hmm. but we don't ever interrogate where the capacity is. Right. And I think that love and loving people has to take into account, if you really honestly, like we talk about unconditional love all the time, to me, unconditional love is being able to love somebody within their capacity. It doesn't mean you have to accept the things that, you know, they may only have the capacity to do such and such, and you need more than that. Right. It doesn't mean you have to stay in a bad relationship right. or accept those bad things. But I know that you love me. Mm -hmm. This is what you have. Mm -hmm. And I may have to step away from this because it's not enough for me, but it doesn't mean you don't love me. Right. And it just, it just is a, it's a reset not just for our parental relationships, for all our right. relationships. It's just, and now I'm in the habit of trying to help people understand my capacity, right? It's just like, right, I don't. You have so much I don't have going it. on, right? Yeah. But I guess it's, it will have to start with you, right? To understanding your own capacities right. and limitations and setting boundaries for yourself in order for you to be able to also share that with to other people. To share that people, with people, yeah. Right. And we don't do a lot of introspection. Like, we don't do a yeah. lot of that. Because that's work. hard. Oh, it's that's, hard. That's really hard work. Yeah. Who wants to say, I can't do it? Right. <laughs> I don't Who have it. Who wants to say, it was me. I yeah. made a mistake. I made a mistake. Right? Um, even in parenting, that's really, oh, yeah. that's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, but I am curious about the journey from that little girl to the Tirana that we're sitting here with today. 
mm. and understanding what does it take and is there are there shortcuts oh, you no. know are there ways <laughs> <laughs> that's the <a> short answer <laughs> <laughs> you know and you said that i saw one uh interview that you did where you were talking about a joy journal Oh, yeah. um, and that you had all of these books and these manuals mm -hmm. um, that just didn't apply to you necessarily in like your realities. Um, and a lot of times we are excluded from these manuals oh, where there'd yeah. be like birthing books, motherhood books. It's oh, just yeah. like they're not written for with us in mind. And then you recognizing that and starting to keep a log mm -hmm. of just small joyous moments Yeah, because what happened was, and we, uh, those of a certain age will remember the, the when uh, sort of, uh, what is it called? Not enlightenment. Which one? It's this word that we use for, oh gosh, I can't think, it'll come to me. Okay, not woke. No, not woke, <laughs> not, woke. <laughs> not woke. But it was an age of like, you know, Deepak Chopra and the okay. secret, and okay. mindfulness. Yeah. Yes, mindfulness. okay, right. yes. So when sort of mindfulness became, started becoming popular, mm -hmm. you know, we had, we just had a flurry of information mm -hmm. in like the early 90s mm -hmm. late you know mid 90s whatever and um and I felt like this is just this is my personal experience but it just when I was broke yeah. right I was young right. and a young single mother working in a nonprofit, yeah which means broke right and so everything I saw told me that I had to seek something outside of my right that you had to pay for. Reach, exactly, right? in order to find joy mm -hmm. or peace or harmony or happiness. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, you, you, I rem I'll never forget watching the, the thing for the, I guess, infomercial or whatever for The Secret. Mm -hmm. And I was so, remember The Secret, y'all? We was, yeah. <laughs> they had us. <laughs> we gonna manifest, <laughs> you know? And I believe in manifestation, but I don't believe you gotta pay $79.99. Right. <laughs> to figure out how to manifest, right? <laughs> right? And I remember watching that whole thing and it got to the end and you can get the seven CD. Mm -hmm. And it was like $150. Mm -hmm. I don't have $150. Yeah. And the, the sense of justice in my mind said, wait a minute. So mm -hmm. because I'm poor, mm -hmm. I don't get to have joy. Mm -hmm. I don't get to manifest. I don't get, that's how this, that's not how the world works. Mm -hmm. I just could not believe mm -hmm. that if I couldn't afford the low, low price of, <laughs> that I'm just left out. Right. And then in addition to that, the things that I read did not include, the, the times when I felt joy, I didn't see them documented in these things. Yeah. It was like, go on vacation, get a hobby, right? right? And I was yes. like, well, no, again, I can't <laughs> afford that. <laughs> I don't right. have a vacation day, right. and if I did, right. I can't put, you couldn't put vacations on layaway like you could now. Exactly. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't do that. No so it just, it was, we don't talk enough about the economic barriers to the, the because joy and has been commodified in such a way, I know tons of survivors right now in all sort of economic conditions who don't, literally still today, can't take time off of work, can't. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that I started the Joy Journal because, again, Virgo, mm -hmm. I wanted evidence yeah. that my life had joy in it already, right. that I generated joy. Right. And I would, I mean, I would document, I was, you know, like most people with journals, I did it for like five months straight and then I put it down, but, but I would document every time I felt just even a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you, in the interview, you probably heard me tell the story about my daughter and my bracelets. Yes. That I would um, pick up my child from daycare, uh -huh. and every single day, I've been wearing these bracelets my mother gave me. They, y'all Caribbean folks know. They, they, I've had them forever. My mother passed them down to me. These are my, I don't take them off really. Uh -huh. um, so, so it's a sound that you know, it's like your slippers. You're hearing your yeah. parents' slippers, you hear yeah. your bracelets. Yeah. My daughter would hear my bracelets. And literally every day, it was a long corridor, you would hear them at the end saying, my mommy's here! <laughs> and then, you know, the running down the hall and then jumping steps. in my arms. It was just like, this is joy. Yeah. I don't have to pay for this. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is it. You sit around, you get a bunch of black women sit around. Yes. And we tell terrible jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know the jokes. <laughs> And we cackle and we laugh and yes. we whatever, so and your to, your, to your stomach is yes. hurting. 
that you barely even speak in words, but you know what each other you saying. You know this what you're like, saying. Ah! Like, ah! <laughs> this is the joy that I have already. Right. I don't right. have to pay for it. Nobody has to teach me how to access it. It's not What happens books. is that white supremacy says, I'm not trying to go this deep, but still, white supremacy says. <laughs> We're going to go there. We're always going to go there in the Schomburg. That they get to tell us what the joy is. They get to yeah. define what the joy is. Oh, yeah. black girl, that can't be joy because it doesn't look like this. Right. Right? right. If right. I like to w put on my big earrings and listen to the worst music possible and twerk all day until yes. I fall out, why can't that be joy? Yes. Why can't that be, a, you know, a, an experience? That's joy, that's cardio. <laughs> exactly. It's doing multiple things. And I'm going to tell you, before therapy, because I wasn't in therapy at this time, before, how I started my journey to, to healing was, was declaring for myself that I generate joy. That I, at this age, in this place, with this amount of money, mm -hmm. I generate joy. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me. It just was so. I'm, it just was so infuriating to me that you would tell poor people that we can't have access to something right. that you didn't give us in the first place. Right. So that's how I started my journey. Like my my. I didn't have language like I want to heal or right. You know, I didn't even call myself a survivor. I was just like I feel like I have an albatross around my neck. Yeah. And. You know, again, I didn't... you said that about Maya. Yeah, like I, I had air to breathe. I... Yeah, that's from Intizaki. Oh yes, that's from Intizaki. Yes. Yeah, yes. and it's funny because this I had to explain this to somebody before. I was like, there's these nuggets in the book that are specifically for people who read black literature and yeah. black women. Yeah. And so this woman was like, this is so beautiful that you wrote. That. I was like, that is from For Color Girls, sis. Oh it's not yeah. <laughs> That's not me. That's a nod to Intizaki. <laughs> That's not, you know, but I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that people wouldn't get it. So I have yeah. to constantly be like, that, yeah. But that part about no air was because my mother's favorite play uh -huh. was for colored girls. Right. And similar to Maya Angelou and the other books, um, I didn't necessarily understand the play, but my mother would play the Broadway, um, the record. Yeah all the time. So it would just seep in. <laughs> mama is here, by the My way. My mother is here. Yes, yes. hey, mama. <laughs> so I, I grew up memorizing for color. I had it memorized. I was yeah. like in the seventh grade, like without, you know, I yeah. have loved you assiduously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for eight months, two weeks, and you know, I was that kid. I was like, <laughs> oh my God. You know, that was I was totally like, me. I was just sharing with my family how I would always do the phenomenal woman poem when I was. I'm like, like I was a little kid. I want to say my poem, and it's like it's the rise of my hips. It's exactly. just like that's so. Because my haughtiness offended you. I was like <laughs> incredible. I was like I had too much information. But, yes. But I because I didn't I didn't know what it meant. But this is the beauty of storytelling and yeah. of of connection and blackness in a way to me too, because when she would say, in the, in the night with Bo, Bo Willie Brown, mm -hmm. when she kept repeating, there was no air. I, I just, something about that, even now it makes me, because I can hear it in that voice, it, it just made sense in my body. Yeah. Right? I didn't know what was happening. I knew the drama of the play, but it just, so I used to say it all the time. Yeah. I used to say it all the time, just randomly, like, there was no air. <laughs> like, extra dramatic ass eighth grader. <laughs> but the reason why I added it in the book is because there, that's the feeling. It was like, mm -hmm. for, these, for me as a little black girl, but now looking back at all of us, there just wasn't, it felt like, when you saw these other kids, they, they breathed a rare air yeah. that we didn't have access to. Yeah. You know, when do we get to be carefree? When do we get to be free? When do we yeah. get to not be- Not even in youth. Not even yeah. in youth. Yeah. You know, I'm fighting girls who look like me yeah. for absolutely no reason. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, I have this line in the book where I'm just like, well, of course I'm gonna fight you because you look like me and who the fuck am I? Yeah. You I'm know, nothing, so you're I'm nothing. nothing, so you're nothing, and so we just gonna fight it out. Yeah. And and the the people around us, the adults around us, particularly these educators, the teachers in our schools, right. they didn't, they were not invested in our lives in that way. Yeah. No, they couldn't be. No. 
So we came to them as damaged goods. Yeah. You know, and look at these like animals savior fighting each conflict. other. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And you talk about correcting one of your teachers when he brought in, yeah. one of your white English <laughs> teachers brought in Phenomenal Woman. And he was like, you guys are going to like this today. Y'all are going to love yeah. this poem. And Mr. then he says, <laughs> he says, what's she talking about? And then he said, she's talking about, I'm just as good as a white woman. And you were like, now how did she get in? <laughs> <laughs> Where did she come from? And you corrected him. Yeah, it just, again, I say this in the book too. I don't, th I didn't probably have the language of white supremacy, but I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, hmm, you could feel it. Something right you know? about that. It was just like, I grew up in a very black household. Right. In a very black family. And, you know. Where your grandfather was my, very pro black. My grandfather used to take me right down the Liberation Bookstore when every, you know, I'm so glad to be in Harlem. So I can say that. <laughs> yes. and people know and people what I'm know talking what I'm about, saying. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and remember there was another bookstore on 125th where he used to get the cassette tapes. I'm going to test y'all. You remember this? When you used to be able to get the cassette tapes of, this is pre-podcast, mm -hmm. but you can listen to like John Henry Clark and Dr. <laughs> ben on cassette tape. You're right. He, they, he would buy lectures. So I wasn't going to the park and getting ice cream like other little children. <laughs> My granddaddy would put me in his van and drive down here and we would drive around listening to like Dr. Ben Yosef. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And like he saw me reading Roots when I was in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget this. And he said, you reading that book? And I was like, yeah, granddad. And he was like, like it's in his mind, he's like, okay, you ready? <laughs> And then he came back, but he came back with like, they came before Columbus. And I was like, oh, okay. Like you next know? level. Yeah, and I was like, it was Sex and Race by J.A. Rogers. Yeah. In the seventh yeah. grade. I was right. like, this is really intense. Right, right. <laughs> but I'm, I appreciate it because it grounded me in, in, a, in blackness, but also in a sense of who I was. And that's what my granddad would say, you just gotta know who you are in this country and who this country thinks you are. Right, so they can't tell you. Right, you have to know. Yeah. And so that was helpful, it's like I was, I, was, I was raised in that, and my mother was just, you know, had me in, I was speaking Swahili and going to Muslim daycare, learning Swahili <laughs> at like three years old. We was black, black. <laughs> We, we, was, we, was, we was by a birthday cake on Malcolm X's birthday. Night. Yes, I saw that in the book. That was we was, I couldn't, my mother's hair, she could tell you God is my witness because she did it. <laughs> I couldn't wear red, white, and blue as a combination of colors when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Right, Ma? Not getting into my mother, I would, I would put a, I would right. have on like jeans, a red shirt, and white sneakers, and my mother would be like, are you an American flag? <laughs> go outside. Right, she was teaching you already not oh, to stand boy. Up for the, the pledge also. Yeah, no, not yeah, to I couldn't pledge allegiance that. in the yeah. school. Mm -hmm. So it was me and a Jehovah Witness kid. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, are you? No. <laughs> we just believe in liberation. <laughs> My granddad said I can't pledge allegiance to a country that don't have no allegiance to me. Hello. <laughs> Hello. You know, Granddaddy. it was very, very black. And so when I got to this class and this teacher said, Maya Angelou was saying that she was just as, just as good as white women. Yeah. I was like, oh, <coughs> 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 you know? like Tarana, you have some. Oh God, you said it just like yeah. him. It makes me crazy. <laughs> he used to always call me Tarana. <laughs> right. It's like so annoying. But yeah, I, I, um, I do appreciate what, you know, my mother was a, a, a self, I, she doesn't call herself this, I think, a self-taught scholar. My, I wouldn't know about feminism or literature or anything about, without my mother's deep, deep, deep connection to these things, which she got from her father. Yeah. And so that is who I am. Right. I could not have written this book without what she gave me. Right. And it's, it's, it's a tradition that I value mm -hmm. so, so much. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember, um, because of course, besides my Angelos, it's so funny because my Angelos talked about in the book and people keep asking me about it, but it really was Toni Morrison <laughs> that, that kind of, you know, once I read 
uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and I started reading that. It was starting with Maya, and then It was you starting, but then I remember reading Beloved for the first time. But that was like a whole, that was like another Ooh. step. I remember also reading Maya first, because it was so easy to access. It was but easy then, access. Tony was like a whole. Well, not blue as I. Well, I found it really hard. Blue as I? Yeah, when I was in high what school. I guess it's just it, when you have these stories, they change meaning. And yeah. the way that I understood them seemed so wrong when I read them now. And I'm like, oh, that's I think that's what fine she was though. Cause, to say. Yeah, because when I first read Beloved, I had no idea what she was talking about. Yeah, I was like, what? what? <laughs> it was, it was, I had no idea, but I right. was intrigued. Yeah. I was so intrigued. And then I read Blue Aside. Okay. And I was like, Pacola. You know, it just, it yeah. just, and I think then with Sula, and it was like, I have to keep reading Sula over and over and over again, because <laughs> you just yeah. have to. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, these, I knew these women. Yeah. Before I knew Shakespeare. Totally. Or, you know, I, I'll never forget having an argument, not an argument, a debate in, in like, maybe a 10th or 11th grade about the canon, the mm -hmm. classics. Mm hmm and my English teacher going on and on about Chaucer. And, <laughs> you know, and I was like, you don't have no James Baldwin in there? No Toni Morrison? I was right. like, why black people don't, can't be in the canon? Right, no. She's like, that's just not how the academy <laughs> has, and I'm like, my mother said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, it seems like these stories gave you so much language. Mm. And I remember reading these stories and feeling like, yes, that's the thing that I've been trying to say for right. so many years that I had no idea how to like let out of my body and yes. how naming a thing can liberate you in so many ways. And sometimes yes. when you don't have the words, these women, books like this, are able to provide something. Like when you said, I have no air, it's like, that to me sounds like anxiety. Yes, <laughs> right. Something I had as a child, and you write about having anxiety yeah. and not having the words to be like, this is anxiety, or having that being a conversation in your household, as it often isn't it in isn't. many black households, um, and the power of stories to be able to do this for you. I think the highest compliment that I can receive, that I have received about this book is that, is yeah. people saying that you have articulated a thing that I haven't been able to give language to. Yeah. You have expressed something that I've been trying to say or get people to understand for so long. Right. That is, uh, it's just a blessing to be able to do that and to con continue in that tradition because yeah. it also, it feels like, well, this is, this is the price you pay, right? This is what was given to me. This is what reciprocity looks like. Yeah. I want there to be, I mean, there's so much more information now, so much more, um, access than we had when we were younger. But there's still gonna be some little black girl who will pick up this book yeah. and feel seen totally. in a way that, that she didn't think was possible. Right. Which is why I didn't wanna focus on the last four years. I wanted the book to go back to the very and I beginning. I thought that was so brilliant. When I first opened it, you have the prologue and it starts mm. in the now, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it starts more recently. And I was wondering, I was like, why are we starting here? And then you went all the way back. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it's such a heavy book and, and I really encourage all of you all to read it. And we're gonna have questions after also, but it's just the language that you use also, the things you talk about like in the black community mm -hmm. and like at the barbecues, yeah. and, like, the number runners and like Mr. West and yeah. like your fear, how so like how you're taught even as a young black girl to protect black men mm -hmm. over yourself. And you were like seven or eight and seven. you were like, I am gonna keep this in my body cause I wanna protect this man that I love. So it's like so inherent in the, in the tradition for you to just shrink and just. And I hope people make the connection that it's not, it's, we are taught to protect black men at an early age, but that's because of what the environment we're in. Totally. Right? You so, see what's happening, you see right. black men th being thrown against walls. That's what I see, I saw, right? I knew at seven even, I knew what consequences were. Yeah. Were. Yeah. And it was a word that we used in my house a lot. Well, yeah. <laughs> and so, but beyond that, I knew that when law enforcement showed up, it was not good for us. No, never. That's not something that we wanted. Right. I, whether I understood the larger whatever, I knew that. Right. And children shouldn't know that. Yeah. Children shouldn't have to know or understand. You know, the whole protect and serve thing was never a reality. Yeah, no. For me. No, Or right. probably the, 
the kids, you know, I was at a thing that, this is gonna sound like I'm name dropping, but I'm not. <laughs> but I was at a thing the other day and um, uh, Benson and Stabler, you know, <laughs> Mariska Hargitay and Chris Maloney from, from Law and Order uh -huh. were there. And this young man got up to take a picture with them and he said, you know, growing up, where I come from, you can't, ain't no cops that you could really like, so y'all were the only cops yeah. I ever really liked. <laughs> I know. And yeah. They, they were like, okay, you know, it was, but I was like, this is, this is the reality, right? We don't have, we never had that luxury of, of, of um, although we've had to call and engage with police to bring them into our homes and things like that, right. that's not always. Right, but Something you had else. this community, mm -hmm. Mr. West and these men who kind of provided this protection yeah. uh, for the community, and that, that kind of exists too. It um, does, and I also wanted to highlight that because there's another part of this moment that, that gets distorted about black men, right? And this moment meaning around Me Too and, this, and the movement. Oh, yes. And, and my reality is I have had amazing black men around me my whole life. And that's why I thought Mr. West was, I mean. Oh, he's just, he, he was, was a fan, he's fantastic. And then, you know, it's just, then you see, realized what your biggest fear was yeah. at eight. And so then that reinforces also the idea of shrinking the stories and like storing exactly. it in a place, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I want to talk to you all day. <laughs> just me and you, I have so much to say. Uh, but we, I do want um, to allow the audience, there are two microphones um, kind of in the middle of the uh, auditorium where you can ask questions if anything has come to are you. Are microphones? Yeah, they're a little, they're there and oh. there. So you can just go up to the microphone. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. And we're live streaming, so if you can talk into the mic, everyone. Oh, I don't think I knew that either. Yeah, everyone <laughs> can hear you on the mic. Okay. And we are going to have book signing after. Yeah. Um, yes. If anyone wants to purchase a book in the bookshop and have Tarana sign it. Okay, we have a question. Well, good evening, ladies, gentlemen. Hi. Good evening. And I thank the men who are here to support this event with females. My name is Dr. <laughs> David. And, um, I just want to elaborate a little bit on a couple of statements that you made. You know, I come from three generations of rape so far that I know about. Myself, my daughter, and my granddaughter. Mm. That will be 22 years old this week. And my question is, When are we going to come together again and love each other and trust each other and stop telling each other, oh, you hot in the behind or you're this, you're that, you're the other and stop saying, oh, you think you better now because you're a doctor and I'm, I'm left out. Yeah. The, the thing is, what you're, part of what you're describing is, is rape culture. And, you know, every community has a different version of this, this what you're talking about. It's, not, it's definitely not particular to our community. Um, but there certainly has to be a shift in culture and how we socialize our young children, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much um, victim blaming, that happens, and it's sort of what I was talking about in the book where <clears throat> even from a loving place, we're giving these messages from a very young age, and I'm talking specifically about little girls, yeah. um, about how we have to protect our bodies. Yeah. Like those of us, I'm sure many of you can, can had somebody in your life say, go put some clothes on uh -huh. when a man comes to the house, even though you have clothes on, yeah. right? Put more clothes on. Right. What, that sends a message about, first of all, the man, or the men in general, but also the onus is on us to protect our bodies all the time. Right. If this man happens to be predatory, then it's up to me to protect myself. Right. Right? Right. 
we have we get we give these messages to children and we don't we get, so you grow up feeling like you have a litany of rules uh -huh. that you have to you don't let don't sit on any, anybody's lap no. don't let anybody touch your private parts right you go put, you put some clothes on you, you go to church and your your skirt is up this high and they, they go put and rush and put something on there to cover your legs a like strange all do that yeah, Strange, yeah, absolutely. Strange women at church will come and... There are, there are these, these messages that we give to girls, very particularly black girls, cultural messages, over and over and over again. They get embedded in our brain. And so then the response is, did you break one of those rules? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's an interrogation first yeah. as opposed to an acceptance or, or, or saying, you know, if one of those rules are broken, it's not your fault. Right. And why are we not talking to the men or and, the boys? And, and, the social, and, the, and boys are being socialized. Yeah, absolutely. We are, boys or young men are being socialized to believe that they are entitled uh -huh. to our bodies. Right. Right? Right. All of the messages about, you know, you take her out, you bought her dinner, what do you get? Yeah. You know, or yeah. even when you're little children, right? This is one that drives me crazy when you, when, the little girl comes home and says, so-and-so is bothering me. Oh, he likes you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So-and-so hit me. Oh, he likes you. Uh -huh. You know, so part of what has to happen is us re-socializing. And we have to unlearn these things. Yeah. So that we can re-socialize our young people because it, this generation and the generations after that need to have new understanding, new messages. And again, my, that wasn't even my problem. What I talk about in the book is my issue wasn't that I didn't think I was gonna be believed. Yeah. My issue was that I knew I would be believed because I did have protective, loving people around me. Right. But part of the problem in that, and we definitely do this, y'all know black folks do this a lot. The other thing you hear is, somebody touch you, I'm gonna kill them. Yeah. Somebody put their hands on you, I'm gonna kill them. Yeah. You come and tell me. So what that does to, again, that puts the onus on us to protect not just ourselves, but now the family. So for me, exactly. there was no question in my mind that my mother and my stepfather would not have gone to the ends of the earth yeah. to protect me against somebody that hurt me. Yeah. I had been told that, granddaddy, uncles, I had yeah. four uncles. And my Angelo's uncles killed same, And they had done the same thing they in the book, right? And, and killed right. her abuser. So there was no question in my mind that would happen. I knew when my I knew when my stepfather kept his pistol. Mm -hmm. I'd seen him mm -hmm. enact violence. So in there the was name no of, reason for you to not believe. That there was this no reason for me not to believe that. So we give those messages to children. That's a lot for a child to carry. Yeah. So we have to be clear, first of all, that the adult is always wrong. Yeah. In the instance somebody harms you, that is not your fault. You can bring that to me and we will resolve it. Right. But the kind of like, what were you wearing? It's your fault. You yeah. broke a rule. Or the, I'm going to kill him. Let me know. Right. Both of those, those extremes right. are, end up being harmful to, to children. And yeah. so, to your point, sis, I don't know where you went. Some of this is about the work that we have to do individually in our community, in our families, in our churches, and wherever your sphere of influence is. We have to start shifting language mm -hmm. and, and really having more courageous conversations. Yeah. We don't even want to talk about sexual violence. No. Right? Or sexuality. Or, right, even sexuality, people. gender. We don't want to yeah. have these conversations. Yeah. But the other piece is you may have a loving person. There's another woman I talk about in the book, Miss Davis. Oh, my gosh, yes. You know, and I wanted to tell that story because it just illuminates how sometimes you do have a kind ear. And a person, she was very well-meaning. Yeah. But she knew the consequences too. And so instead of embracing me and offering a different pathway, it was like, just be quiet. And I'll help you keep your secret. Yeah, I'll help you keep your secret because this is what we do best. Yeah. yeah. Right? Our bodies become bur burial grounds yeah. for these secrets. Yeah. And we just, and other people just, the elders who've done it before, it becomes normalized. Yeah. They're like, well, of course you'll keep, just be quiet. Yeah. If you be quiet and live your life, it'll go away. It's a tradition. It's a tradition. Yeah. And so part of what we have to do, sis, is break that tradition. I hope you're talking to your grandbaby 
and your daughter and y'all are having open conversations and you are talking about you know that this that, that this was not their fault that they are not the sum total of the things that happened to them like these are the things we have to normalize saying as opposed to not saying anything at all or you know a, a whole host of other things mm -hmm. it just really starts with us mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, they 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 got some, you know, we got cameras everywhere. No, it's getting it's really getting out of hand. It's this it's certainly getting out of hand. Yeah. Yeah. They can film you inside of your phones and your cameras and everybody is paying too much attention to the cell phone. I've been violating my own home and recording and put on a phone. Oh no. Oh Lord. I will say this. Though there's legislation, it's not the legislation is going to solve the problem, but there is le growing legislation across the country to deal with cyber um, stalking and, and pornography and the things that you're describing. So hopefully that will continue to bring awareness to the issue. I want to move to the next question so we can have. Go ahead. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being, what do they call it, the canary in the coal mine to this whole topic. Mm. It's a watershed moment. Uh, specifically a watershed moment for the black community because this is a topic I don't think we've ever touched or talked about. Mm -hmm. Here's my question. I know a little bit about your background and how you have worked in nonprofits. You've done much writing, mm -hmm. worked on deadlines. This is a very different project. So what tips would you have, some key things that you used having a writing background, but working with a very personal and a very passionate project. What tips yeah. do you offer? Because you were able to integrate some of your own skills, but still it was a new and very passionate project. What do you offer for some of us, even writing simple memoirs? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, it's, it's easy after the books to be like, well, let me give you these tips that I use. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm gonna tell you, since during the memoir, I'd, I would write and put it down. I, this is the thing, I can, I'm gonna tell you what my process was. And it wasn't, I don't, I'm not saying this is a healthy process and I'm not even saying it is um, one that would work for everybody. But I would advise to not let yourself be consumed by it. And so I would write, the book is late. <laughs> this book was supposed to be our last year. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. But the pandemic came and I, instead of having utilizing this time you know everybody was like if you didn't come out the pandemic with a oh. llc and a oh, Lord. business plan <laughs> what was you doing i was LLC like Twitter. sleeping <laughs> <laughs> but i just i could not write i really had a hard time and so the bulk of the book was written between september of last year and march of this year oh. i don't advise that <laughs> don't advise that at all which meant that i had to just kind of when I needed breaks, I almost, I couldn't take as many as I would have. Um, so I would say step away from it. Sometimes I had to though, like I would write a part that was really, really hard and I couldn't write for a week. Um, and I allowed myself to do that. And um, so that's one. The other thing was, I, my, so a lot of y'all may know Dr. Imani Perry. If you don't, you mm -hmm. should know her. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. She's one of my good girlfriends and one of the, um, things that she gave me as a tip way back, I started in 2019. She had me write down a list of every memory in my life that I could think of. It was insane. I was like, I, like really? She's like, anything, even if it feels inconsequential, like if it comes up, write it down. So I spent like a week and just bullets, you know, like grocery store with grandma, like mm -hmm. just whatever, just mm -hmm. bullets. Um, but it was a great exercise. I realized now what she was doing is, it was helping me go back inside mm -hmm. to these places that I, cause I came into this with a little bit of like, I mean, I know my life, right. you know, start here, go here. Yeah. And when I started writing, I was like, oh wait, I don't know my life. <laughs> so, so that was a good exercise for me. Um, I also, that last thing I'll say is I didn't read anybody else mm. during this process. I thought, so, um, another friend of mine who has a, an amazing um, memoir is Kese Lehman. His, mm. uh, his, his heavy. heavy is his, mm -hmm. is his um, memoir. And I love Heavy. 
and mm -hmm. I wanted to like be inspired. This is back again in 2019. So I, summer, I went away and I took these books with me and I started reading heavy and then I was like, I can't write like this. <laughs> you know, they say well, comparison is a thief of joy. Do yeah. not read, uh, and I've heard other writers say this too since then, just, I just did not read anything else. I stopped, once I got through that and I had that feeling, I shook that off. And I was like, this is my book, my story, my voice, my way that I write. It's, you can't compare it to anybody else. So that was helpful too. So I didn't think about other people's stuff and, at all. Now I'm catching up on everything. <laughs> So we have time for this last question, and we also only have about two to three minutes, so I'm going to ask, at least in this forum, that we keep our question <laughs> and our answer short, but if you have time for the book signing afterwards, then you can have a little bit more discussion there. So Schomburg Tradition. is so good. Schomburg you are ready? <laughs> good afternoon. My name is Trina Chestnut, and the reason... I truly wanted to hear what you had to say. The fact that you've healed the way that you have, and you don't have that enormous amount of wanting to go toward the anger of that person mm -hmm. that harmed you, to receive that is amazing to me because as a result of many, many years mm -hmm. of dealing with hearing from others the sense of whatever occurred to me that they don't have details and knowledge of mm -hmm. is to tell me how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. It's over, it happened, it's done, you're consumed, you're obsessed, you think of this person, you concentrate on them. What makes it worse, that wasn't from outside people. It was internal yeah. and it was in my family. Yeah. And the majority of it, was with women, mm -hmm. which made it so difficult for me to feel the trust okay. and mm -hmm. continuous emotions of love that I thought I had for those relatives mm -hmm. and then discovered when I was years older, they knew about the danger of that particular party who unfortunately married into my family. And I can't Recall a moment where I didn't think in my own head, how could someone never, ever consider literally a child as a toddler and not think of the later years, not because you had to live in the house with that person, you may know of them, but what about the danger to that child that has no knowledge of what impending doom is going to fall upon yep. them? And this person had two guns. They definitely use them, often and frequent. And someone even asked me, but did they shoot you? Mm. And this was from a relative, Ooh. and my thought was, mm. I heard the words you just said, but you're asking me the fact that I wasn't shot should make me feel... Grateful. Yeah. 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 I'm it's tell very, you. very difficult for me to reconcile. And believe me, I know your time is short, so... I'm no, not no, even okay. going to the other part of the question I had, but I can appreciate the fact that you had a mother and a stepfather who you didn't look upon as unsafe or dangerous or you were unable to vocalize yourself. Yeah. So I bless you for that because I wish I could say that I could say it occurred to me, but it, it wasn't my circumstance. And thank you for your book mm -hmm. and for speaking. Thank yes. you. Can I just say, and I'll say this in closing, I know there's probably other survivors in the, in the room. I consider myself healing. I'm definitely not healed. I think this is, this is the kind of wound that is, you constantly have to work on. And there have been years of my life where I just couldn't, where I just didn't, mm -hmm. where I just existed. So I, I don't like to put myself out as sort of an example of a destination that you can arrive to. As more, as more like a journey that you can take along with me, mm -hmm. right? And so that, you know, we have very different circumstances in some regard, but the thing that changed, one of the things that helped change for me is when I was, became painfully clear that I cannot control them 
There's a, there's a story that I didn't even put in the book. And, I, and I, this, is, this is a sample of like not being this healed person. I couldn't put it in the book because I just couldn't bear to tell another story. And I just, I just left it out. Yeah. But when I realized I could, I, and when I say them, you can't control the person that harmed you. People think about sexual violence as the point of violence. But it really is the things that happen after the violence that consume you, right? It's the, it's the thing that, that, that the violence leaves with you and the thing that people reinforce mm -hmm. in you afterwards. Mm -hmm. And we have to heal from all of that. And so one, I'm just, I, I'm so sorry that you didn't have that level of support, but the beautiful thing is, it is never too late. It is never too late to start a journey, to pick up a journey. And really, once you acknowledge that you wanna be on the journey, every single thing you do is a part of that journey. Mm -hmm. We, we, we have been, we have romanticized the idea of healing mm -hmm. and like, you know, in, in a way that is really unhealthy, I mm -hmm. think, because there's an ugly underbelly that we don't like to talk about. We like to give listicles and say, these are 10 ways that you can heal yourself, yeah. right? And yeah. wrap it up in a neat bowl, but we don't want to talk about the days you can't drag yourself out of bed yeah. and you cry uncontrollably and you sit in the yeah. dark and you write nonsense or you scream at the top of your lungs or you want to scream at the top of your lungs. Right. But the thing is, all of that is a part of healing. Yeah. It really is. So just because it doesn't look pretty and just because it's not surrounded by the, some of the best work I've done, the most important work I've done, I did with strangers. Mm -hmm. People who I'd never met before, who just knew that we were connected in, in our trauma yeah. and in these stories. And so I think that there is, just based on what I heard from you just now, that you are poised and, and very uniquely positioned to start a journey or to pick up a journey that will take you in a whole different place. And it won't require the permission of the people who denied you all your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do wanna say thank you to her for just congratulating you, and it takes a lot of courage to make this and write this and sit with this and share it with all of us so that we can start on our own journeys or continue our journeys. So thank you, Toronto. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Schomburg. This is beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> And thank you all for coming and being such an attentive audience. I am going to ask you all to start making your way into the Links and Hughes lobby, but I'm so grateful, Tarana, that you joined us and Sasha as well. Um, you can get your book in the Schomburg shop. Uh, following this conversation, we have a screening of Black Rodeo, which was a rodeo that took place in Randall's Island across from uh, across Harlem River. Uh, it was an all-black rodeo. It featured 50 black cowboys. So if you don't know that particular history, uh, Muhammad Ali paraded through the streets of Harlem to promote that rodeo. So if you would like to stay and you have the time, we hope that you do so. But please keep all of your conversation and questions for Tarana outside in the Langston Hughes lobby. Thank you for joining us. Take care.